if we called a play in the huddle and we walked up to the line of scrimmage, we were running that play hell or high water. What? My name is Sir Yad, and I'm on a mission to interview every Cleveland Browns starting quarterback since 1999. We know their names and we've seen them struggle, but do we know their side of the story? This is Since 99. The Cleveland Browns have won the game. For our next Browns quarterback interview, we head to San Diego, California to talk to this four-time Pro Bowler. All right, we're now welcoming on Jeff Garcia, San Francisco 49ers legend. But I think the uh, the biggest accomplishment you've had is having success at the quarterback position after playing for the Cleveland Browns, which is like a death sentence in the NFL. I think you might be the only one. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, when you look <laughs> at Browns quarterbacks of the past that have moved on from the Cleveland Browns, I mean, it pretty much was, unfortunately, a graveyard. I mean, they were pretty much dying there in Cleveland and not having much life after that. I took another year and somewhat another year of death in Detroit, but was able to refine my way out in Philly and Tampa mm -hmm. and have some positive to the end of my career. Did you think at the time that, I mean, obviously, I guess you wouldn't sign with a, uh, a place you thought it was a graveyard, but that you signed a four-year contract, I believe, correct? That's right. Did you yes. feel at the time that there was like this buffer of like, oh, like we, whatever, we're not going to be good, but maybe after like a year or two, we'll, we'll turn it around? Not at all. I mean, the team had gone to the playoffs two years prior, I believe, after the 2002 season. Mm -hmm. They were a playoff team, lost a tough game against Pittsburgh, should have won that game. Yep. Yep. Uh, there were two major comebacks that day, Pittsburgh coming back on Cleveland and then us coming back on the Giants. That's right. On that wild card weekend. But uh, I didn't look at Cleveland that way. I looked at them as a great history of football. Uh, Crazy, diehard fans, Crazy uh, fanatic, fanatical group of fans that just uh, support through and through. And looking at the actual makeup of the team, and I was looking at the roster again today, and I saw a lot of quality players on that roster. And I didn't see why we couldn't put something together at that time. Uh, was there a pivotal moment in your, I guess, growing up in your life that maybe gave you like this confidence that you could be a uh, professional football player or have some sort of career going up? I don't really think that there was, to be honest with you. I mean, of course, as a kid, I had that dream. I want to be a, an NFL quarterback. I remember writing it in a fourth grade autobiography. My mom still had it years ago. She pulled it out and, you know, that was my dream. My dad was a football coach at the junior college in my hometown. So I was able to grow up around the sport. And so when I started playing the game, I had athletic ability, but I wasn't anything special. And I think it took a lot of hard work and dedication. I mean, I came out of high school. I wasn't highly recruited. I had to go to the junior college for a year and actually play for my dad. That's when I think I really started to come into my own, when my physical abilities started to catch up with my mental abilities to grasp the game. So Gavlin, you were there for a year, and then like you said, went to San Jose State, had a pretty good career there, despite having you know a, a very good career at San Jose State, the All-American Honors. You uh, were deemed, I believe, too short to play the quarterback position, and guys like Trent Dilfer and other people were, were selected in the 1994 draft. Um, do you think like, that gave you a chip on your shoulder being undrafted? I think the chip developed early for whatever reason. Uh, coming out of high school, not recruited, not really looked at as a potential collegiate athlete, uh, that chip started to kind of form at that time. Yes, coming out of San Jose State, going to the East-West Shrine game, playing in a major college all-star game against the elite of college. You have Notre Dame, Miami, Georgia, Auburn. You have all those colleges represented, Michigan, USC. Um, and I'm named the MVP of the game but yet still not looked at as a potential mm. NFL quarterback. And a lot of that was because of, at the time, the prototype was the Troy Aikman of the world. Everybody wanted 6'4", 225, Vinny Testaverde, 6'5". We got you Baker know, going number one, Kyler Murray, Bryce Young might go number one. You know, if I were coming out of college today, I think it'd be a different story. I was just 20 five years ahead of my time. <laughs> what I feel like now in the, in, the, in the Canadian Football League is 
guys seem that as like another death sentence where it's like, oh, like if I'm in the Canadian Football League, it basically means that my NFL career is over. Do you still feel like it's like a place where guys like you and Doug Flutie who came back in the NFL after that can kind of hone their craft? I believe it can be, especially for the quarterback position. The game is a little different, but at the end of the day, it's reading, making good decisions, being accurate with your throws, it's timing, it's mm -hmm. all those things that that are important to have at the NFL level. And I think coming out as a 21, 22, 23 year old out of college, you're nowhere near the player that you are capable of being like me coming back into the NFL or into the NFL at 29 years old. I was so much, uh, I was just smarter. I was stronger. I was, my abilities had continued to grow year in and year out. Uh, I was continuing to challenge myself better myself. At 29, did you feel like you were gonna, like, do you feel like that was too late? Like, cause all these other guys have these careers, they start at 22, 23. Did you ever have that thought of like, I don't, am I ever gonna have a, a could you, I know you worked out with the 49ers and right. during your Canadian football league time, but did you ever feel like it was too late? Oh yeah, believe me. Uh, that fifth year in Canada, I had already bought a home in Calgary. I had opened up a Mexican food restaurant in Calgary. <laughs> I mean, I was sinking roots down thinking that, hey, the NFL just isn't gonna happen for me. Uh, but I'm having a great time. I'm in a great city, love Calgary. Being in Calgary, I just truly embraced it, enjoyed it, and thought that, well, if this is my career, I'm gonna start doing what my teammates are doing. A lot of my teammates had off-season jobs. And so I started to look into that, and then all of a sudden we win the Grey Cup and uh, I started to get some interest from NFL teams and you know, the whole world changed for me. So not only did you get a chance in the NFL, you got a chance with the, the team you end up, you know, you grew up rooting for. You know, a guy like just with legends at the quarterback position, Joe Montana, Steve Young. Do you feel like there was like any added pressure of you know, trying to follow in those footsteps at all? I think initially I didn't really look at it that way. I looked at it like I'm gonna learn from Steve Young. I'm gonna have a chance to watch a future Hall of Famer, a Super Bowl winner, an, N an MVP in so many ways. I'm gonna be able to watch him and learn and grow and have time to basically continue to develop. And maybe in a couple years, he's gonna retire and then I'll step in as the starter and I'll be ready to just roll with it. Well, that changed in the fourth game of the season, I believe it was, and concussion. he goes down with yeah. a concussion. And now all of a sudden I'm throwing into the fire and I'm still learning the system and still growing. And the thing about backup quarterbacks, I mean, you're not getting many reps in practice. You're pretty much running the scout team. So from a physical standpoint, I probably wasn't as prepared. Mentally, I was prepared to do what I needed to do. And the thing about it, they're not gonna wait for you. You gotta make it happen right now. And in those first five starts, I had a great first start against the Tennessee Titans, who went on to the Super Bowl that year and lost to the Rams. But we beat Tennessee at home in my first start at, at the stick, at Candlestick. And then the wheels slowly started to fall off over the next four games. Really struggled. My worst game being against Pittsburgh on a rainy, nasty day at home. And then I got benched. And so a lot of doubt started to creep into my mind. Like, am I truly ready for the NFL? Um, started to doubt myself in certain ways, especially on the field. Uh, really tried to, uh, you know, I'm looking at myself as you're the only major difference in the change of the team uh, from the quarterback position when, t when people would look at the team and, well, what's the major change? Well, the quarterback is different. You know, they had Steve Young and Joe Montana. Now this Jeff Garcia guy, and now they're not winning games. You know, that was hard. That was hard at the time. And when I got benched, it gave me a chance to take a step back, watch another quarterback play the position, watch him struggle just as I was struggling, not do any better. And when I got a chance to go back in as a starter after I think two games of watching from the sideline, the way I played the game in those last five starts compared to the first five starts, was drastically different, which led to the next year, which I set a record, which still stands for the 49ers for passing yards in a season at 4,200 yards. So one thing I love about your story is maybe you were overlooked, maybe you didn't get the opportunities right away, but man, when you got the opportunity, like you said, like the iron's hot, I'm gonna strike. And you had three Pro Bowl selections in three straight years in San Francisco. You're, I mean, 
you're throwing to guys like Jerry Rice, Terrell Owens. Like, for you growing up as a 49ers fan, you probably, I mean, if I was you, I'd be geeking out at like, holy cow, I'm throwing to Jerry Rice, like the greatest wide receiver of all time. Did you feel like that too? Or? Oh, absolutely. And having grown up watching Jerry, obviously Joe Montana was my idol. Uh, the 49ers were the team that I, you know, loved to watch and, and supported. And knowing that they were in somewhat my backyard, I mean, the local team, and, and, and the 80s and 90s, I mean, they were one of the top organizations in the National Football League, winning consistently Super Bowl titles, all those things. I ran into Jerry when I was at San Jose State and when I was old enough to go to a bar. <laughs> there was a big bar downtown San Jose uh, near the campus called San Jose Live. And, one night I'm in there with some buddies and there's Jerry kind of standing by himself drinking a beer and you know I probably was feeling confident at the yeah, time yeah. and walked up to him and I'm like hey Jerry hey I'm Jeff Garcia I play quarterback at San Jose State and he's like oh cool nice to meet you Jeff and I'm like yeah hey Jerry one day I'm gonna be throwing passes to you man and he's like cool man all right <laughs> and that was kind of the end of the conversation right so fast forward about six, seven years. Now here I am, a 49er, and I'm getting a chance to throw to Jerry. My God. I didn't remind him of the story. Yeah. I think I did tell the story to somebody else, though, and then it was brought to his attention, and he was like, yeah, I kind of remember that, whether he did or not. <laughs> Who knows? So talking about the other wide receiver that you play with, I, if I was your agent, I'm just saying, I would have gotten you a brand deal with Excedrin for the headaches that you had to deal with with Terrell Owens. Having like just, I mean, him like being incredibly vocal and just like obviously there was there was a riff. You guys still had a very very good connection on the field. Like one of the probably the best in that time frame of you having that Pro Bowl run. Despite all that, like having the on, off the field stuff, all the stuff that he was vocal about before he got traded to Philadelphia. Um, what was what was that relationship like with him dealing with him? Yeah, you know, I mean, for the first few years, uh, things seemed to be. Fine. I mean, things were good, you know, uh, feeding him the rock, letting him be creative out on the field, uh, make things happen like he was capable of doing. Uh, Hit the Cowboys logo with the I mean, with the football. you know, he kind of, he was his own worst enemy at times, yeah. right? And unfortunately, his way of acting out and having fun and, and, and being different didn't always agree with the rules and regulations of the uh, coaching staff or of the ownership, right? And so, you know, there were a couple times where he got reprimanded and, and you know, it pissed him off. It kind of created a, somewhat of a chip on his shoulder that the world was against him, so to speak. And for whatever reason, he and I, got to a point where he just didn't, he didn't support me as the starting quarterback of that team. And you could look at the statistics of those five years that we played together, and they are equal, if not better, than just about every quarterback receiver tandem in the National yeah. Football League. And it, and it got to a point where I actually had to go up to him and squash the whatever the problem was because it was eating me up. I'm sure it was eating him up. It wasn't allowing us to be good teammates toward each other or for our team. And, you know, eventually we put the rift behind us, but it doesn't mean that <laughs> he chose his words wisely moving forward. I mean, he continued to um, speak his opinion yeah, or Philadelphia too. He just was speak talking. his words and, you know, he – he said some things about me post 49er days that, you know, I had to go out and basically defend. And, and you know, when somebody wants to stoop to that level, um, I tried to just be the bigger person, be politically correct, handle it the correct way and just put it behind me. But, yeah. I mean, deep down there were there were there there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of, like, frustration and a, a pissed off attitude toward things that had happened and things that were said and um, you know but hey we I put that behind me and I moved on and 
Um, you know, other teams got to experience what he was all about, and some of it was good, and some of it was not so good. One more sign of me. So I'm assuming you don't have a working relationship with him right now. We actually have, you know, I mean, I don't because I just, I don't see him or cross paths with him, but there were a few years ago when we were still working out and he would come down to San Diego and we had a group with Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers and a bunch of the quarterbacks that lived down here in San Diego and we'd be throwing out of high school and T.O. started coming down and we were able to actually have a talk and put it, you know, basically say it's water under the bridge now, you know. He actually apologized for some of the things that were said in the past and, you know, I appreciated that moment and took it for what it was and that's why, like, I mean, you don't ever hear me say anything bad about the guy. I mean, I, I feel like the guy was an unbelievable talent. He was so gifted. He worked extremely hard at it. Uh, he was a physical specimen during his time. And, uh, you know, he's a Hall of Famer because of it. Before we jump into the Brown stuff, what was it like with three Pro Bowl selections after your entire the trajectory of your, your career, um, being overlooked, being undrafted, having to go to the Canadian Football League, and now coming back and – you know, having a lot of success, throwing to Jerry Rice and, and just leading the 49ers to the playoffs for your, your hometown football team? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, to have that experience right in front of family, friends, everybody that I grew up around. Uh, I had a tremendous supporting group fan base out there from my hometown. And uh, being a local college guy, San Jose State, I mean, we literally practiced in Santa Clara, which is 15 minutes away. And there were so many positives that came out of that and to be able to prove myself out there on the field and to lead that team back to the playoffs to have the years that I had the Pro Bowl experiences uh, you know I was definitely playing with that chip on my shoulder wanting to prove to people that I belong that I uh, was not a mistake in them bringing me from the Canadian Football League to the NFL that I can make the transition and adapt to the game and in 2000 two and we go into the playoffs and we have the big comeback against the New York Giants and then we we you know the next week we struggled against Tampa who had, who eventually goes on to win the Super Bowl that year but then to fire Steve Mariucci and I think that just came out of left field to a lot of us and it was kind of like gosh we just have overcome an old team we're young again we're competitive yeah we've been in the playoffs the last two years uh we took over the Rams for the division title, who the Rams were on a hot streak. Mm -hmm. uh, now you're gonna fire the head coach. And uh, that, that just unfortunately was the downfall of that Niner organization for many years following. That consistency, that breakup in the head coach, a bunch of the assistants, the changeover, uh, it just wasn't the same. And we struggled in certain, certain areas. And so that was unfortunate because we were a lot better than what we showed on the field that year. Totally, and those struggles led you to come to the Cleveland Browns in 2004. In 2004, we were super excited. Just you know, me growing up at the time, I was in, I was in fourth grade, and I'm like, holy cow, this guy just had three Pro Bowls. He plays with a good organization, the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, like the, the buzz in the town was was super excited, and I'm I'm sure you could you could feel that coming in. But um, what do you feel like? How do you feel your your time in Cleveland went, or, or what would, what did it feel like? From your, from your shoes? I mean, I was excited too. I felt like this was a team, like I said, two seasons prior, had gone to the playoffs. Uh, it was an organization that you has a lot of history, obviously. They were coming back. They were the expansion organization, mm -hmm. but you know, you knew the history of that team. And, and I remember watching the Cardiac Kids, Brian Sipe, who's a San Diego State guy, oh, okay. who still coaches high school football. I see Brian out at Torrey Pines High School right down the road. Um, but I remember watching him and those teams back in the day and how close they were. A couple of those tough Denver Bronco games that I know people don't want to relive. But, you know, um, but watching them back in the day and knowing how competitive they were and then coming back and just knowing just somewhat of the fan base and how how they were. I was excited. I was excited to come into Cleveland and show what I was capable of, see if I could be that missing ingredient, um, bring 
hopefully some consistency to the position. And, you know, I think as much as we all wanted to see positive things happen, and it really started off in a positive way with a big win on opening day at home, which hadn't been repeated uh, not until like this year. last season. Literally last season. On the road, they finally won an opening season game uh, nearly 20 years later. Um, but that being said, the way we started with beating Baltimore at home and couldn't have been a better start, right? And, uh, you know, I think that obviously, even though it was just the first game of the season, people saw an electricity on the field and excitement on the field that they truly believe that, hey, this could be different than what Brown's teams were in the past. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it didn't continue that way. I think. In those first, I think I started the first 11 games before an injury sidelined me. But, I mean, we were 3-3 three and three after six games. And we lost a tough game in overtime to Philly, who ended up going to the Super Bowl that year. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Pittsburgh. We couldn't get past Pittsburgh. And, you know, just certain things here and there that, I think could have been different with us. That could have been a different path to how the season would go, but unfortunately it didn't happen. And, you know, we look at the Browns organization. We look at the 20 plus years of them being back in the NFL. And you compare that to the teams that have consistently been on top or consistently been competitive. And it all starts from the top. Oh, yeah. And it starts with the front office, which then trickles down to the coaching staff, which then trickles down to the players. And when you're constantly turning over important members of the team and the organization, and there's a new philosophy that comes in, there's a new want for different players, for a different scheme, different philosophy, different mentality, you're going to struggle to compete against the best teams in the National Football League. I mean, this is the elite of the elite, you know, when every time you change out a GM and management, every time you change out a head coaching, a head coach and his staff, um, you're taking steps back. You're not taking steps forward. It's, it's going to take time before you take a step forward. And then all of a sudden, well, you've given that guy two years and he hasn't turned it around. Well, now we're starting over again. And, you know, that whole mentality just has unfortunately been um, one of suffering for Browns fans. You have to tell me twice. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, and, and, you know, looking back at a few years ago, I actually liked, and I, I don't know the inside um, relationship and what went on in the locker room with Baker Mayfield. I liked that he was a scrappy player, kind of reminded me of myself in ways. I thought that he had enough moxie, enough presence to be successful on the field. Obviously, he can't do it himself. He's got to have a pretty good team around him. But gosh, you're, you're a fourth down away from going to the AFC Championship game, right? Mm -hmm. They were a fourth down away from beating the Chiefs and going to the AFC title game. And now all of a sudden the next year, there's a focus on making quick changes and things aren't going the way that we want them to go. And now we got to find another answer to the problem. And it's like, sometimes you got to figure out and work through the problem. It just seems like every or other organization, even the Lions now at some point, I figured it out, and uh, you know maybe one day the Cleveland Browns will. Well, but. going into that season, the GM was Carmen Policy, who was a former 49er GM himself mm. in 2004. He's who brought me into Cleveland. Him and Dwight Clark, who was still a part of the front office, those are the guys who signed me to Cleveland. And then they got fired before I even really stepped foot on, on, uh, on the ground there. Um, you know, and then just looking at philosophies, Butch Davis, who was the head coach at the time, uh, more of a defensive minded coach, had a guy by the name of Terry Robisky who was running the offense. Mm -hmm. You talk about uh, a system that 
was very um, limited from a quarterback standpoint. We had no audible system. So if, if we called a play in the huddle and we walked up to the line of scrimmage, we were running that play hell or high water. What? There was no audible system to get out of a play, to check out of a play. There were no situations of um, calling two plays in a huddle, scratching a play at a line of scrimmage to get to the better play based upon what you see from a defense standpoint. So when you go into a, a game like that where you're basically uh, putting all of the decision-making on the coach from the sideline and you being the player that has to fulfill that decision-making, even though there are times when you're just either not protected or you're not in the proper situation, uh, that is frustrating, especially for a quarterback that came out of the West Coast system where you had options, where you had check out ability. Did you ever call, like, I, I mean, I, I didn't, clearly I have no quarterback experience, but did you ever call, even though there wasn't an audible system in, could you have called an audible and just be like, screw this, like, we have to I run mean, something else? Yeah, I think you could have gotten to that point. And me probably being in my first year with Terry as the OC and, and being there, I was just trying to put all of my belief and trust into what his system was and making it work. And believe me, we had, with my quarterback coach, Steve Hagen at the time, we had many conversations in our quarterback room about the limitations that we as quarterbacks have in running this system and how it's just not an NFL prototype system. I came from it's crazy, San man. Francisco where the West Coast system is entrenched throughout the National Football League with a lot of teams that have had success. And I'm just going, well, gosh, this is not how I've learned to play the quarterback position and you're handcuffing me in playing it this way. What do you think the overarching theme was that it just didn't work out? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, again, you look at just um, changes within organization. Um, I felt like, gosh, when we came through training camp, when I did the entire off-season program there in Cleveland, I saw a group of guys working their tail off. I saw a group that was hungry. I saw some quality leaders. Andre Davis on defense at the middle linebacker position. 99 yard touchdown. Andre pass. Davis, the receiver. Oh, is there Andre? So there were Andre and Andre. It's my bad. One was Andre, Andre one was my Andre. Bad. My bad, Andre. Both were Davises. <laughs> one was a middle linebacker, one that. was a wide receiver. Not know that. And Davis, the receiver, I was looking up his statistics because he had great speed and he had some big catches that season. And I think he only had 14 catches on the year. And I'm like, gosh, why wasn't he utilized more? Yeah. You know, and so looking at, I mean, we had two running backs, Green and Suggs, that both had ability uh, to carry the rock, that were both explosive. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I saw a team that had pieces to the puzzle, but for whatever reason, we couldn't get it together. It just seems know? like a broken record, man. It's just like, it seems like they've had those pieces, like yeah. even like when Tim Couch came in, because I mean... Tim Couch was the sixth greatest high school athlete of all time. He was marked in 2003. So you have guys like LeBron, Tiger Woods at the time that are like the only people ahead of him. And it, it didn't work out. And they're like, okay, like Jeff coming in, other guys. And it seems like a revolving door. And it, obviously, like with the success you had after the Browns, it wasn't on you. It wasn't on I mean, every piece was together. It's just like, sorry, I'm about to have him belt and I'm sweating bullets right now. <laughs> I remember getting the call. And, you know... I went through that season. It ended up being a difficult year. I had a couple injuries toward the end of the season. You know, I start dating Carmela, who becomes my wife. I meet her there in Cleveland. Oh, nice. we had our own. She's from. Uh, she's from Avon Lake. She's. From I was born there. There you go. West Side. Yeah. West she's Side, baby. From out there, I met her out there, and uh, you know, we had some off-field drama as well that that contributed to the experience of just not being the most positive one, right? And so I'm back home in California in the off season. I get a call from Romeo Cornell, who's now been hired as the head coach. So the entire staff 
pretty much let go after Butch Davis had resigned with five games left. Robisky came in and was Robisky the was the interim head coach, took over. Um, all those guys are gone. New GM comes in, I think Savage, Bill who Savage. used to be in Baltimore, yep. hires Romeo Cornell. I get a call. It's January or so. I'm back home in California, and it's Romeo, and he's like, hey, Jeff. Hey, this is Coach Romeo from the Browns. And I'm like, hey, Coach, how you doing? He's like, uh, yeah, we're going to release you. We just feel that you don't fit into our future plans. And which, are, which were what? I have no idea. What were the plans? Well, Did he tell Charlie you? Charlie Fry and Trent Dilfer were the, were the initial plans to come in and play the quarterback position the next year. But, yeah, you know, it was like they were cleaning house once again, you know, starting over once again. And yeah. every time you start over, it just puts you further behind. I think at that point, too, you know, I'm – not, I don't have a fully developed brain. I don't know if I do right now anyways, but as aside from the point, I'm thinking at that point, like, okay, this is like a, this is like a, a, a repeating pattern. Like yeah. we just, at, looking back at it now, I'm like, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but it's like, how can we not figure this thing out? So obviously you were released one year into your four year contract. Yeah. Um, you then have a brief stint with the Detroit Lions. At that point, before we talk about the Eagles, you had you last year in San Francisco. There was a little bit of struggle. Browns, you know, same thing. And then Detroit. Yeah. Where are you at mentally? Yeah, you know, coming out of Cleveland, really trying to figure out what would be my next step. Where would I go in in the NFL? Who would be interested in in still having me after this past season and the season before in San Fran? And I had some options, and I had some decent options, but. I felt like I still was a starting quarterback. The entire coaching staff that had been with me in San Francisco, oh, Steve Mariucci, was with Steve Mariucci yeah. and so many of his assistants, Greg Olson, the quarterback coach, uh, Ted Toner, the offense coordinator, they were all now in Detroit. Tom Rathman, the running back coach. So I knew all these guys, right? And Joey Harrington was their quarterback. And I knew that there was a short leash on Joey, that he had not been the guy that they thought he would be, being the first number one pick for them. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could go in with Mariucci there, knowing the system, that I could compete right away to be the starter there. But I went to Detroit. <laughs> I went to, uh, you know, the other organization that really had a lot of similarity mm -hmm. to Cleveland. Just the changeover, turnover, um, constant change, not being able to compete. And in the last preseason game in Buffalo, I broke my fibula. So that really was a turn of events for me. I just me. did that, by the way. You broke your fibula? Except I was at my high school reunion. Yeah, Had well. Had too much fun. You were yeah, playing football. some dance moves. I got uh, no, crazy. I can't dance. I just slipped on ice during one of the uh, biggest storms in Cleveland history. But, you know, didn't remember it. Anyways. <laughs> well, I broke my fibula in Buffalo in a preseason game. And so I missed the first eight weeks of the season. So it really turns that season around for me. It changes the whole dynamic of it all. Actually, my first start that season when I was, when I felt like I was healthy enough to come back, I was rushing to come back. I wanted to get back on the field. The team was struggling. First start was in Cleveland. I know, against the Browns. and you won. And we won. And you won. And I was only on one leg. And was that like leg. bitter? Was that some I like, was on one and a half legs. Some revenge? Game. You beat us uh, on one leg? I mean, pretty much. <laughs> I still had kind of a broken <laughs> Um, Man. But no, deep down, there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of like in your face type you, Like mentality. in the interview, you're probably like, oh, you know, it's just like another game, you know, just, you know, on to the next one. But oh, I mean, sideline. because, you know, as much as fans can show some love, they can show some hate as well. And believe me, when things aren't going well, you tend to hear some of those things coming oh, yeah. out of people at times. And, and, you know, I heard it, and I get it. Hey, people want to see a winner on the field, and they're tired of supporting some team that's not winning or putting their good, hard-earned money toward things that aren't paying off in a positive way. And, you know, but coming back into that situation, yeah, I wanted to, you know, more than anything, I wanted to show Romeo that he made a mistake and the Browns organization that they made a mistake and that I am 
still a quality player. And, you know, hey, it was one game. It was one game. But that season didn't end up being what I was hoping it would be as well. And so when I came out of Detroit, again, here's two years in a row where the head coach doesn't even make it through the entire season. Butch resigned the year before. Mooch got fired with four games left. Holy cow. In that season. So again, we finished with an interim head coach. I had only signed a one-year deal um, there because I didn't know really what the situation would be like in the future, whether I really wanted to be there. I, you know, there was a lot of feeling out going on for me. And coming out of that year, I knew now that, okay, I'm getting to that point in my career. The last couple years have been a struggle. I don't know what's in my future, but what's more important to me now as opposed to a few years ago is that I want to go to an organization that has some continuity, that has some consistency, that is capable of winning. Whether I'm the quarterback or not, I want to be a part of a winner. And that's what led me to go to Philadelphia. I knew that I was not going to be the starting quarterback. I was basically relinquishing that want or hope that I would have a chance to start or compete to be a starter. But I was going to an organization that had just been in the Super Bowl a couple years prior. They had been constantly winning, constantly in NFC was championship T Was T.O. on the team? T.O. had been released All right, to good. Dallas. All right, I'm making sure. Good, good. <laughs> he was gone. You're making sure that, that's, that's not, that wasn't a part of the I was that not was, reuniting That was definitely with a part of the decision. But, um, you know, I was going to a place where at least we had a chance to win. What was crazy, too, is you – Another situation where you are counted out, you come in, Donald McNabb's injured, you come in, the Eagles, there's no way they make the playoffs, you win five consecutive games. I think you won the NFC East, I believe, we and did. then you yeah. go to the playoffs. Yeah. That had to feel pretty good to come back and after being counted out and now you're on top again and going to the playoffs. Uh, it felt awesome, to be yeah. honest with you, especially after living through the previous two seasons in some very tough situations. Uh, to now come into a situation where nobody expects this team to finish on top. You know, that year wasn't any different. Maybe Washington was a little bit on the low side, but New York, the Giants were tough. Dallas was tough, is where T.O. was, my buddy. And, uh, <laughs> and then there we were in Philly, and we were 5-5, five 5-6 and five, five and six after my first start, 6-6 six and six after the Carolina game. We go on this three-game road tour mm -hmm. and we end up coming back to Philly and we're now nine and six and in basically in the lead for the NFC East division title. And you know from the from the beginning, the my first start at home against Carolina on that Monday night game, I got power driven in the second quarter into the ground by their big nose guard. I forget his I don't, I forget his name. I mean he was pushing 350. And he picked me up and power drove me into the ground, which would be illegal today. Yes. You know, but hey, back then it was a good legal hit. I'm, I'm on the ground wrenching trying to get my air. And the backup, A.J. Feely, gets up to warm up and the crowd goes crazy. They start cheering. And deep down inside of me... The I mean, Eagle, got, Eagles crowd? The Eagles crowd. They, they, because A.J. Feely was like a favorite for them. Well, he had started a couple years before in a similar situation when Donovan went down and he had a little bit of success. And so he kind of was that fan favorite that they remembered and they start cheering. And I take it like personally, like you're cheering. I'm wrenching on the ground. I don't know why you're cheering for, I don't realize you're cheering for AJ, but I just feel like you're cheering that I'm not getting up, yeah. you know? Well, I get up and I stay in the game and we we bring it back. We win the game. And, and you know, it almost was an FU mentality that I was playing with at that point, you know? And going on the road and winning those three games and then coming back, uh, that dynamic had changed in a great way. Uh, in that stadium and uh, you know it was it was a blast it was a lot of fun and and we damn near went to the NFC championship game that year we lost a tough one in New Orleans mm -hmm. by uh, three or less and uh, 
we were right there in it. And it's unfortunate because I, I love that team. I love playing for that team, love playing for Andy Reid. And, uh, but it was a one and done type year for me. It was one of those things where I was just trying to figure out what would be the next step for me, knowing that I was not gonna be a starter, but all of a sudden getting that opportunity on the field and again, being prepared for the opportunity. I think one of the things that even Andy Reid has brought up in the past uh, when he talked about my situation there in Philadelphia was that going through training camp, you know, my attitude was that, yeah, I know Donovan's the starter, but I'm gonna push his ass. I wanna make sure that he's prepared mentally, physically. I'm gonna challenge him. I'm gonna be the best that I can be for this team. When I step on the field, when I step into this huddle, I'm gonna lead them like we're the starters. I mean, I remember stepping in during training camp. I'm usually running the second team. Donovan's running the first team. Well, the second team offense usually goes against the first team defense. So I got these guys fired up in the huddle. I said, you're not, you're not the backups, man. They may be the starters, we're the 1A. We're 1A. We're a play away from being starters ourselves. We gotta have that mentality. We gotta go out there and we gotta take advantage of these opportunities. And just having that mindset and that preparation and then just that like, that grit in the huddle. You know, it was a different style. Donovan was kind of like, fun and jovial and he liked to joke and have a good time. But like, it was almost like guys relied on him to make the play, you know, because he was such a talented player. You gotta I be fired up, I, I'm not gonna be a When I stepped anytime. on the field, I think it elevated everybody else to step up and make a play. So now you're back. You got, you know, you led the Eagles to the playoffs. You then go over to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who were a four and 12 team the year before. You have another Pro Bowl season. You lead them to win the NFC South and go to the playoffs. Where's the mentality right now? Where's your mental state right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm feeling pretty good as a quarterback. I feel like I'm reproving myself, uh, reestablish myself as, as a top tier quarterback in the National Football League. I think if there was ever a coach in the National Football League that challenged me uh, mentally uh, the most, it was definitely John Gruden and how he prepared me as a quarterback, how I was expected to prepare, how I, I was expected to manage a game at the line of scrimmage. Did he let you we talk ball? about <laughs> we talk about the differences of what my ability was there in Tampa with an audible system, with a check with me system. Then he was going to support me as compared to the hands that were cuffed in Cleveland, you correct. know? And I think in 2019, you were nominated for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, correct? I think that was the first year, yes. So, I'm gonna make a case for you to be in the Hall of Fame, and we said this before at the beginning of, of the interview, but you had success before, you went to the Browns, and you had success after. So, the NFL, if you are listening, that is Jeff Garcia's Pro Football Hall of Fame resume right there. Well, I don't know if there are many quarterbacks that went to as many different teams as I did, but yet still had success. I won or was part of three division titles that I helped lead. So I won an NFC West division title, I won an NFC East division title, and I won an NFC South division title. It's the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I also had a hell of a career in Canada. And you know, quarterbacks oftentimes are not so um, measured just on the statistical information, but it's that championship win at the end of the season. And unfortunately, I don't have that in the NFL. But that being said, I think that I played at a high level for a majority of my career, even though there were constant change and constant adversity and, and new discovery and learning and all those things that you had to adjust to, but yet I continued to find my way and compete at a high level. Well, I think even coming from all the way to, you know, playing for your dad at, at Gavilan to where you ended up, all the stuff you ended up doing, you know, I'm not saying who needs the Hall of Fame, who needs that, that would be cool to be in, but, you know, I don't think you have to prove to anybody that you had a hell of a career. So after your career, what has it been like, I guess, I, we asked this for every quarterback that we're with, but, but um, adjusting from that structure, adjusting from, you know, being the guy, having that structured life to, okay, now I'm, you know, I gotta figure out like the rest of my life, the rest of retirement. The transition was not easy. And I think that the NFL 
and players in general are starting to do a better job of preparing themselves for life after football. They're working on so many more things, building their brand. Uh, so much of what the athletes today are going through and experiencing and developing for themselves, either we didn't have our, at our disposal back then or we weren't thinking that mindset as much. And so coming to the end of my career, you know, the story for me is I went to Oakland. I was going to finish my career in the Bay Area, the East Bay Area, started on the West Bay Area side. Now I was going to finish in the East Bay Area side. Got frustrated with being the backup to Jamarcus Russell in his third season in the NFL, which ended up being his last season in the NFL. I didn't want to go through the, the so-called politics of the game and sit there knowing that I felt like I was the better player, the better leader, the better quarterback for that team, but yet not given a chance to be that guy. So I asked to be released. And that ended up being the end of my career, so to speak. I had two weeks in Philly, and then I was back home watching from the couch and frustrated. I was really frustrated. For the first part of that season, it was a struggle for me to watch other quarterbacks play the game, watch quarterbacks play the game that I felt like, gosh, they're not me. Um, eventually, I realized that, first of all, I'm living down here in Southern California, San Diego. It's beautiful. Secondly, and more importantly, I have two babies, beautiful, healthy children at home, and I'm healthy. I'm able to be a dad. Uh, I had a great career that uh, financially was rewarding as well. And it just put me in a place to where I can pick and choose what I want to participate in, what I'm passionate in. Um, but that transition has not been an easy one in that sense because I've dabbled in TV. I've dabbled in coaching. Um, I've tried to find that shtick that I could really sink my teeth into and have that passion for and have that daily grind and uh, motivation and inspiration to be a part of. And, you know, that has not been easy, but I have been so blessed with four beautiful kids that are active, that are in athletics, that compete in sports. You probably see some of my posts. I'll follow you on Instagram, and it seems like, I mean, yesterday you were saying uh, it, your kids were announcing uh, your, your daughter's uh, basketball game. And I, I can just tell, like, how soaked up you are and just how much you love being a dad of those those four kids. Like, I mean, it seems it, like it made, it's, it's, awesome. it's awesome. I've been able to coach my younger boys, Pop Warner team, the last two seasons. We've been San Diego section champions. You know, he's a little quarterback. Um, my boys play basketball. My girls play basketball. They play volleyball. They play just about everything. Um, my oldest daughter played JV basketball. She's a freshman at the high school here. She was named Defensive Player of the Year. So I posted on Instagram, you know, a nice little picture uh, thing and, and message about my daughter winning Defensive Player of the Year on her team. And she was so upset about it <laughs> and hated my dad, hated dad for posting pictures that she did not she did not approve of and that oh she did God. not like and dad it's so embarrassed you need to take that down i mean it was up for two hours and i took it down oh my god I'm like, honey i'm praising you when i coached in 2015 with the st louis rams their last year in st louis i was in st louis my family was here in san diego it made me realize as much as that's what i grew up with and my dad was a coach and i loved being around it this level professionally, collegiately, even at high school, it's a different demand on a coach. And I had to be willing to sacrifice all of the things that I just had so much joy in talking about right now, in coaching my kids, being a part of their events, their uh, activities, their sports, all those things. I wouldn't have been able to do that. I see too many of my friends that are coaches that have not had that relationship with their own children. Last question for you. How do you want people to remember Jeff Garcia? I just, I think when you look at how I played the game and and uh, just the grit, the determination, the toughness, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like what I 
represented out there on the field was that blue collar, hard worker mentality. You know, a lot like the Cleveland fans, a lot like the Philadelphia fans, uh, grit, toughness, determination. Um, you know, that was really what I was all about. I mean, I felt like I played bigger and bolder than what my physical appearance or presence gave to you. When you're on the Hall of Fame, you're gonna be uh you're gonna go in as a Brown, correct? Absolutely. I'm gonna go in <laughs> as as number five. Number five, baby, right here. As number five. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, man. It was an honor meeting you. Pre appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm just like, it's a different vibe than like in California. It is. Expectations are high. Here we go. I'm gonna drop half the burger. Sponsor us. <laughs> Sponsor. Nice new cam. But yeah, we didn't know what to expect. Especially, I don't know how bad it's been down here, but up in LA, it's just been raining. Like, 